Welcome to Pi Data. Uh, we are the Pi Data DC chapter, but um, since we're virtual, uh, we can be your Pi Data as well. And we're really glad that um, uh, you all joined us, especially those of you who aren't in the DC area. And we're going to start by reading, I'll read the <clears throat> Pi Data code of conduct and then I'll post this in the chat. This is the short version. Uh, be kind to others, do not insult or put down others, behave professionally. Uh, remember that harassment and sexist, racist, or exclusionary jokes and language are not appropriate for Pi Data. All communications should be appropriate for a professional audience, including people of many different backgrounds, sexual language and imagery is not appropriate. Pi Data is dedicated to providing a harassment-free event experience for everyone, uh, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, or religion. We do not tolerate harassment of participants in any form. Uh, thank you for helping make this a welcoming, friendly community for all. Now I'm going to share the link for reporting violations, so just in case anything comes up, I'm going to throw this in the chat. Uh, you can report it, let us know, and we'll do something about it. Um, I also wanted to start by thanking our partners. So <clears throat> these are the people who helped us uh, make this happen. It includes, um, it includes spell.ml, it includes uh, NVIDIA, Capital One, uh, Metrostar Systems, and of course, Anaconda. So Let's get started with from some announcements from our uh, partners. So Jim, did you want to start? Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, no, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm always loving the chance to talk about Pi Data and NumFocus. Um, I am Jim Weiss. I am the events manager for NumFocus. And uh, people often are wondering, like, what's kind of the relationship between NumFocus and Pi Data? or like even what the heck is NumFocus. Um, so I'm happy for the opportunity to just kind of share that real quick. Uh, NumFocus is the nonprofit organization. We're located in Austin, Texas. Um, and we are the organizers of the PyData educational program. Um, and so I want to thank you for participating in this meetup. Uh, our nonprofit mission focuses on two main area, areas. We uh, directly support 35 open source projects uh, in scientific computer programming. Um, these uh, include some of our favorites like Jupyter and NumPy and SciPy and Matplotlib and Bokeh and 30 others. Um, so if you ever get a chance, just check them out, see which ones you use. Um, super bummed we aren't doing any in-person events this year because uh, people get to learn about our projects when they come pick up stickers. Uh, that's what we've been kind of famous for lately is just a sticker nonprofit who also does some other things. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty cool, you know, handing out all the stickers of all our projects. Um, so yeah, check it out. Um, but so that's, that's one area that we focus on. The other part is supporting the, uh, the community of users and developers of those tools. Uh, and that's kind of where PyData come it comes in. So like I said, PyData is a program of NumFocus. Uh, it's missions to provide a forum for community and users to learn from one another. Uh, we do this by hosting conferences all around the world. Uh, in a normal year, we would have conferences in you know, London and New York and Berlin and South America, Asia. Um, and two years ago in 2018, we had a conference in PyData DC, which was awesome. Uh, I had a lot of fun there and it was, it was a great event. Um, obviously this year, it's uh, a little different. We had a full slate lined up and um, had to slowly kind of push everything to next year for in-person. Um, but I'll uh, explain in a second why we've come up with a, a pretty cool alternative. Um, but the point I kind of always like to mention is, um, you know, these events are important because any proceeds that come from our, our conferences, they go to NumFocus to continue to support our missions of supporting those projects and the users and developers of those tools. So first, thank you, thank you for participating in PyData uh, in terms of the meetups and the conferences. Uh, we actually have 173 meetups across the world and 61 different countries. Uh, so it's a very cool community that I, I really enjoy working with. Uh, so I just always like to say um, thank you. Thank you for participating. Love to see everyone out here. Um, in lieu of our in-person conferences, I really want to foot stomp that we are doing a first of a kind 
PyData Global online conference in November, November 11th to 15th. I invite everyone to come check it out. We have two more weeks left of our extended CFP. If you want to submit a proposal, we've, we've gotten a ton of proposals in so far and we're looking forward to getting some more. So I think it's going to be a fantastic program. Ticket uh, sales are going to open really soon. We're uh, doing this really cool model. Uh, at least I think it's really cool. Um, you know, we're, we're eager to reach a community in the world that has yet to be able to participate in like an in-person regional event. So to lower the barrier of entry, we're, we're trying a kind of pay what you can model for tickets. Uh, we will have recommended ticket prices, um, but for those uh, who might not be able to make that ticket price, we're, we're doing a pay what you can model. So that'll be up on the website soon. The website is global.pydata.org. Uh, and we would love to see everyone there and uh, check it out or follow us on Twitter at PyData for any updates. Um, and that's, that's pretty much all I want to say. So thank you. I appreciate the chance to talk with you. Sure thing. Uh, that's great. All right. I'm going to, I figured out a way to enable people to share their screens, but I have to enable everybody. So don't abuse it or I'll have to shut it off. Um, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> Alexei, did you want to go next? I can, I can, um, if, if, uh, if need be, uh, would it be possible for you to put up the, um, our slide? Sure thing. Just a second. Let me share my screen. Great. Can you guys see the slide? Yeah, looks good. Uh, hey, everyone. So uh, my name is Lexi. I'm the developer advocate at, at Spell. And we're kind of we're excited to partner with uh, the PyData team for tonight's talk. So a little bit about Spell. Uh, Spell is an M MLOps platform. Uh, we aim to streamline machine learning and deep learning experimentation and deployment. And we have this platform where we uh, basically give you an end-to-end -end ML uh, platform with the you know, infrastructure and the tools for preparing, training, deploying, and managing your machine learning projects. Um, and, you know, our, our overall goal is, you know, we work with like teams of, of data scientists and machine learning engineers to help get ML uh, products uh, to production faster. Um, you know, if you want to learn more, um, you can check out our website linked to on that slide, www.spell.ml. And we have a pretty awesome, pretty sweet uh, ML ops newsletter you can sign up for as well if you're interested. Um, and uh, one other thing um, I would love to love to point out is that um, our our next um, PyData event um, will actually feature our CEO, uh, Sircon Piantino, who will be giving a talk, kind of giving an overview of, you know, what is MLOps, what does this space look like, and, you know, why, why should you care about these kinds of things? All right, that's uh, my bit. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, we're, uh, just to emphasize that, so we're doing this again next month, and um, the CEO from Spell is going to be our next speaker. So we're super excited about that. And then um, to signal boost for the PyData Global, um, we're going to hold a viewing party. So uh, if you can't access it through another Py meetup group, you'll be able to access it through ours. Um, just keep an eye out for those emails. Okay, uh, next up, Torian, did you want to uh, give a little bit? Oh, yeah. Hey. All right. So hi, my name is Torian Dyer. I am a technical product manager at NVIDIA uh, based on the Rapids project. Now, Rapids is an open source project powered by NVIDIA where we take some of the APIs that you know and love uh, and created a set of libraries that lets you take your, M your data science and ML workflows and allow them to be run and G on your GPUs, therefore GPU accelerating them. And what that looks like is similar to what we did, what, what NVIDIA is known and famous for with CUDA, where you know, the GPUs accelerated your neural networks and your deep learning pipelines. We're doing the same things for your data science and you know, ETL workflows. So what kind of speed ups are you getting? Well, you know, when we do, if you look at the charts in the bottom, when you, um, what to even be published, we need to do five, one GPU needs to do five times faster than a 40 cores CPU cluster. 
And what you're looking at over there in the GPU speed ups over CPU is in multiples. So we go from anywhere from 5x to hundreds to even thousands of times faster than some CPU um, and, 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 and the, the CPU system. Um, this was shown at scale with TPC XBB, where we basic, as you can see, that was the previous TPC XBB leader. And that was us working at scale for uh, 1,000. And then we're also doing at 10,000 um, K scale. We, we are an open source community. Um, everything is available for you uh, to work with and play. Notebooks, videos, uh, collab, um, Blazing SQL, um, app.blazingsql notebooks. And so we invite you to join us. Um, you can join us on Slack and Google groups, and you can look at us on GitHub. And we'd love for you to like go there, explore what we have, build upon your own data science workflows, um, talk with us on the community and contribute back on GitHub. Show us what you're doing, what cool things have happened, um, and 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 you know, tell us what, where you'd like us to go next. Like I said, we are pretty quick to bring to your existing workflows as we do have API similarity with Pandas, Scikit-Learn, NetworkX, and SciPy S Signal library. And we have um, other accelerators in spatial analytics and, and visualization, which allows you to go from a few hundred, you know, to a few thousand to where we're doing millions of points at a time in near real time. So we hope to see you there, rapids.ai. Um, that's the website. Looking forward. Cool. Um, and I guess, uh, Mike, did you have any announcements you wanted to make? Take that as a no. Um, I didn't. I didn't prepare any slides or anything like that. But um, uh, just thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, thanks everyone for coming out. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot. Well, uh, then I'll make the last one on behalf of Metrostar. Um, we are hiring. Um, we're looking for a DevOps engineer, solutions architect. I work there. Hussein works there. You can talk to us about uh, if we think it's a cool place to work. We do. Um, we'll share these later. But uh, it's for like a really big uh, data project over at Census. So without further ado, um, let's get started. So you all know our speaker, Peter Wang, CEO and co-founder of Anaconda. And he's here uh, wearing the best possible hat. Um, take it away, Peter. Thanks for the uh, for the warm <clears throat> the warm welcome. Ignore the IKEA logo in the side there. This is actually <laughs> what my uh, office looks like. I assure you. Um, I am uh, <clears throat> coming to you live from uh, from Austin, Texas, and so I'm really excited uh, to hang out with the, the DC crowd. Um, and so my talk today. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Here we go presentation mode. Actually, if I, if I share screen and then I do presentation mode, let's see if that works. Yeah, let's try it out. Let's try that. Okay. How's that looking? Can you guys see the main slide or do you see my presenter mode? Uh, we see the main slide. Fantastic. Okay. So uh, two, I guess a poll was done of the attendees. And um, so there are sort of two topics that I'll be speaking to today, mostly about the first topic, open source in regulated environments. Um, and then the second one, I have a few slides on just some thoughts on visualization, especially now during these COVID times and we we're just bombarded with so many infographics. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get right to that. And then we'll have time for, I guess, Q&A, moderated Q&A at the end of this, right? So yeah, great. So um, open source and regulated environments. All right, let's talk about that. Um, so I think the first thing to recognize is that one of the challenges we face when we deal with open source in regulated environments is that is a people problem, namely data scientists. They are new to organizations in general. Now, most organizations have some kind of data analysis capability um, you know, in place already and have probably for decades. But the way data science runs and the way data scientists are is a little bit different than those. And so um, I'm reminded of the, the duckbill platypus, which when uh, maybe people don't realize this, but when it was first discovered, um, many naturalists thought it was a hoax that someone basically you know, glued on a bunch of crap together onto some poor weird animal and called it, a, a, I guess, a mammalian marsupial something or the other. Um, 
And so I think about data scientists showing up in new organizations, and they're also very strange, right? Because they are writing code. Um, they, they, have, they, they want MacBooks instead of, I don't know, an HP laptop. Um, they know math, right? They, they know a lot of math, actually. Um, and then they're doing all sorts of weird things. The IT organizations don't even know what this is about because a dev, they can talk to a dev, they've met Python programmers, but these data scientists don't know how to use the command line, but then they want like 40 GPUs. And so like, what is that all about, right? So I think this idea that if you are a practicing data scientist in a regulated environment, you are probably being viewed by others as a platypus. Um, and, and the odd thing is about this is, so that's the people aspect, who you are as a data scientist even, you're still a little bit weird. And, and um, that should, you know, that's, that's a little bit odd to think about because if we look at um, Python in general on the tech side, right, the tech trend should be that, well, Python's everywhere. We look at the stats, whether it's Stack Overflow, whether it's um, uh, uh, The Economist of all places, <laughs> um, ranking languages. You can see Python has been ascendant certainly um, since 2012, you know, the birth of Anaconda back then. I think we had something to do with that a little bit. But then, um, but if you look at even prior to that, the chart that The Economist shows, it shows since the origin days of Python, right? Um, it's gone up there. So it shouldn't be a newcomer to IT as such. And this is actually an interesting thing, right? A lot of uh, sysadmins or developers, they already have some preconceived notion of what Python is. Um, if they were first exposed to Python in the 90s, they'll be like, oh, Python, yeah, it's a scripting language. I use that because it's a little bit nicer than Bash. Or it was a thing, you know, Perl was stagnating and I picked up Python. Or um, the software dev may use Python, you know, just as a, a kind of a glue utility thing to script some home networking crap. They already have a preconceived notion of what it is. And based on that, that's actually bad for you as a data scientist because they don't know that that same little scripting language can go and do the most cutting edge things in technology, right? They don't think of it that way. Um, so this, even though it's a relatively well-known thing to most technical people at this point, it's um, stature in corporate IT is yet to be carved out. I mean, all of you who practice it in corporate environments, you are helping to carve out, you are the water eroding a new path for this technology. And so Jake Vonderplas has uh, gave a talk uh, at PyCon years ago, and he talked about kind of the, <laughs> the, the stages, Python through the years. Right? In the 90s, it was definitely an alternative to Bash. When I first picked up Python in 99, um, it was like, oh yeah, this is way better than Bash, way easier and reader, more readable than Perl. And oh, cool, it's got like a C API that we can like script. And I was a C++ nerd at the time. And then the 2000s is where SciPy, which was created in 99, um, and then NumPy of course came around in, in uh, 2006. But in, in, that, in the 2000s where the SciPy movement and community really started growing and started building the underlying fundamental pieces for vectorized computing in Python, and then 2010, you know, me and Travis and, and, and many others, uh, you know, the Jupyter folks and, and Wes on Pandas, lots of people put together some of these building blocks that made it possible to really talk about Python as a no kidding data analysis language. Um, not that it doesn't have its warts, of course, everything does, but it is actually quite pleasant to use in a number of cases. And so um, now in the 2020s, I would say, all of a sudden, like, it's like, oh, wow, we're actually the cool kids of the party, right? Because AI, ML, these are things you do with Python. Um, you're not, you know, maybe, maybe somebody will make you recode a bunch of stuff into C++ and TensorFlow, but I mean, it's still, for the most part, Python's everywhere and it's growing. The growth continues. And now what I didn't put on this thing is I think that if we can keep making Python nice and we keep growing it, we can actually have a run at VBA. I think we can have a run at the business analysis and business analyst community, right? And for all the hate that Jupyter Notebooks get, that's like the most accessible kind of interactive, literate, graphical, quantitative computing environment since Excel. Like that, like Jupyter Notebooks are a thing for all of their warts and all of the stuff. And I know all of them. Like it's still amazing. If you think about if you're a data analyst, um, you have Excel or you can go learn how to like blow yourself up with semicolons by learning JavaScript or C++. Jupyter Notebook comes along. It's like, oh yeah, I can, I can do this, right? So I think 2020s are the, the decade of Python everywhere. Hopefully doing mostly good things, let us hope. Um, so one thing that I would like to talk about is then again, sort of on that tech side of things, because Python has, is kind of a known quantity, but it's almost been pigeonholed prematurely. 
um, by, by folks in corporate IT environments, um, a point that really needs to be made to everyone all the time inside regulated environments, inside any kind of legacy corporate environment, is that data science is not the same as software development. And just because somebody is writing Python code, you don't manage the Python code artifact the same way you would if it was a software developer building some giant web system, right? So, uh, so the fact that Python has been a successful glue language for 20 years, the fact that it does have a deep amount of power in embedded and in data analysis and in 3D, 3D scripting, like if you do 3D graphics, Python is the de facto scripting language there. It's made its way into all these niches and that's really rare. Most of the times you do not find a single technology, a single language establishing itself into these niches. They, it might be a broad-based thing that's in, uh, all over the place, or it could be a narrow scripting thing for one thing. But for Python to have so many, that's a really weird thing. And so people appropriately, I think, uh, or not appropriately, but people, it's, it, it can, it's understandable that people pigeonhole it, right? So IT will say, well, this is a dev language. We manage it with our standard dev SDLC. Um, Analysts will look at it and say, oh yeah, but that's not as, you know, I can do that much nicer than SAS or SPSS or R. Um, Python's got all these like weird, like programming language bits to it. Um, so different people coming at the language will have different perspectives. But for you as a data scientist practicing in Python in a corporate environment, in a regulated environment, um, you're, you know, kind of, unfortunately, the cross you get to bear is that you need to uh, really uh, drive this point home that, hey, I know I'm coding. I know the thing I wrote is something we need to put into production, but I'm not a production developer, right? And, and you can't have the developers give them, well, what will happen sometimes is devs will show up and put pressure on the, soft, on the, on the data scientists to um, change their workflows. Now, if they wanna give you feedback on your code, things, ways to refactor to make it a little bit nicer, that's fine. But if they actually wanna change your workflow to look more like a software development workflow, that's where the alarm, bell should be going off because the data science, the exploratory data science to or data analysis to um, feature engineering modeling to production deployment to then round tripping and, and looking at live models and, and model audit and things like that. All of that stuff needs to run a tight loop and it can only run a tight loop if it stays within the vernacular and within kind of like fits in the brain of the data scientist. The instant you start putting other sorts of pieces into it is where it now starts becoming a very um, this, this uh, sort of decomposed process that then your, your agility as a team goes to, goes to zero. So um, this line about Python is misunderstood and data science with Python is not the same as software development with Python. I think that's a point that, um, that folks in corporate environments need to be driving the awareness about. And you can feel free to point back to the slide and, and say, Peter said that, so it must be true or something like that. I don't know. If that works, let me know. I doubt that'll work, but you can try it. Um, but the other reality of this though, I mean, working against you a little bit is that Python really is an excellent glue language. So you'll find all sorts of people contributing ideas and glomming your Python code into a bunch of different places. Um, and even as that might be frustrating, even as that means there's more stakeholders at the table with their opinions, recognize that that is long-term power. It means the technology and the things you're building are relevant to lots of people, people care. The last thing you wanna do is build a thing that no one gives you opinions about because no one cares, right? So. So, reckon, so if, if I could give you a little encouragement as you try to fight the good fight with this point, um, that, would be, that would be the point that I would make. So then, um, so Python in production then, like let's say we clear the IT hurdles and we get tech, uh, we clear the tech hurdles. Um, how do we actually, when we go put Python in production, another thing that you'll find is that um, for the most part, you can't, you have to think of Python as dynamic C. Any, anyone here at a PyData conference, you, know, you are pulling in libraries that have a lot of very low level code in them. You may never even touch those things, but the things you use rely on those things to work well. So uh, when Tarion was talking about Rapids, for instance, right? Rapids, it's very pleasant to use. The interface looks like the data frames you know, but underneath is like 1200 horsepower of a whole lot of low level optimized stuff. So when you talk to um, IT and a lot of DevOps and IT people, they're actually not that, uh, let's say, they're not that old in the field. They've only been doing this for a few years. They don't even know the difference. Like they don't understand compiler flags. So that's not like, can you just dockerize it please, right? So when you talk to them, help them understand that what they're managing here is not just some scripting languages. It's not just like JavaScript. It is actually a fairly sophisticated and intricate thing that you've got and they need to you know, give it the due respect. So 
I think most of the paradigm challenges, and this should be no surprise to anyone to hear me saying this, most of the challenges that people run into putting Python in production is around packaging and distribution. Um, so Mahmoud Hashemi wrote a really great book about uh, enterprise, um, a Python in the enterprise, which I would recommend everyone, if you're looking at um, a regulated environment, you should get that book. He's given great talks. So there's a PyBay talk he gave a couple of years ago where he talks about the gradient of packaging, right? What you need to think about. When, when are you using PIP? When do you need to go to Conda? When, you know, when is appropriate to use Docker? And all of these different kinds of things, a fantastic talk. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the problem we have with Python as technology is that, um, you know, Guido didn't really, or Guido, I guess, didn't really care a lot about packaging as a problem. He always delegated that as someone else's issue. I had a hilarious conversation with PyCon a few years back where he was like, look, I get, I get that this is an issue and you guys are, are solving it and, and there's other people trying to solve it differently and, and all that's, you know, what it is. But to be completely honest, I just never really cared too much about packaging. It was never my problem because if I wanted something to be available, I put it in the standard library. <laughs> and so it's like, well, you can do that and you can't even do it anymore, but, but thanks, you know, that's kind of now we inherit the problems around this. But, um, but actually um, we, we have this issue where, you know, there's not a simple portable unit of, of containment. And so, you know, Go people talk about cargo uh, or yeah, Rust folks will talk about like a lot of other languages have learned from some of the packaging pain in Python and said, you know, we'll do it this way. But actually the grass isn't necessarily greener on that side because the underlying problems that make packaging difficult in Python, they plague everyone. In fact, they plague so like Red Hat and RPM. You know, our Red Hat has to create things like software configurations and some new technologies to support this. And to some extent you can see Docker essentially as web developers uh, essentially um, staging a, a revolt around what's available in the Linux and the CABI and things like that. I mean, we don't have to get into that. I'm only half a can of beer in, so we don't have to get into all that. But you know, this is a problem that affects everyone. It's not just like, oh, packaging is terrible on Python. It's like, well, if packaging was so great on Linux, why did you make Docker, right? So like, this is the, you know, the kind of thing that, this is a problem everyone has. And because again, Python is misunderstood technology. If you're over in you know, web dev land, you see it as just like a scripting language and it's, it's fine. What's the, hard, what's the hard problem? You guys just don't have your stuff together. But again, Python is, you know, we in the SciPy land and NumPy, we are talking about Fortran compilers and Fortran ABIs, right? Uh, we're talking about shipping different versions of the LVM. We've got um, uh, hardware manufacturer specific optimizations uh, to the tune of hundreds of megabytes. So we want to get into people's hands. And those people are not DevOps engineers. They're not software developers. They are, you know, two years out of grad school uh, studying astrophysics or something. So Python has solved an incredibly difficult problem uh, and it's solving a much harder problem. So I want everyone to understand the packaging woes you have in Python are because you're more awesome, because Python is more awesome, not because Python is particularly more broken than any other language. Now, what we have done in Anaconda in creating Conda environments and, and doing our own kind of package building system and linking and all these other things, we've tried to solve this problem as best as we can. And we know there's still um, improvements to be made there, but, um, but, you know, and we're working on that. But the Conda Forge community has been great. We're working very closely with them to advance the state of the art in this, in this uh, sort of thing. And uh, so I would say that, you know, look for good things to come there. Um, and and uh, one thing that used to be more of a problem, I will say this, one thing that used to be more of a problem that I don't hear about as much anymore, um, but like five years ago when, you know, Hadoop and the JVM-based technologies of big data, Spark, Hadoop, and all these things were all the rage. Um, I guess Spark is still kind of a hot thing, but, um, but in any case, there was a lot of like, oh, we have to recode our stuff in Python into Java because IT only knows how to productionize Java. Um, there's still a lot of that, unfortunately. There's still a lot of that. But what I do see happening with the Kubernetes and cloud native revolution with uh, Docker becoming much more mainstream is that IT is essentially on board with this idea of like, okay, everything's microservice. If I can route into you, if I can route into this pod or into this container, then you can run whatever you want to in there. I don't really care. And so I think in a sense, Docker has helped make the Python deployment into what would otherwise have been Java centric Java shops a little bit more, more um, is made a little easier, which is really nice for us. And that, that clears a big hurdle. I was actually like 2014 timeframe. I was really worried about strategically the long-term viability of Python. If we didn't clear the JVM gate or hurdle and, you know, Kubernetes and Docker kind of cleared some of that for us at the IAS level. And it's been um, a nice little thing that's happened for us. Um, so at this point also, I would be remiss if I did not mention that if you really want to um, 
uh, do in especially in regulated environments if you want to be using open source ultimately you, you're going to have to kind of you have this kind of like hard conversation with IT where it's like you know they're asking you where did the software come from and you kind of have to be like well I downloaded it and like from where well from some website with a tilde in it I guess it's somebody's home directory on I think they're a grad student somewhere um, you know that's no good no no good right and um, and I think the uh, the thing I would mention is that if you do use Conda uh, packages or if you want to have if you want to give your IT person a throat to throttle um, and get a lot of this um, stuff to be vendor backed you know if they want a vendor to talk to uh, Anaconda does do that right and in fact we do sell a package server that will mirror and cache um, all of these packages from from R from CRAN as well as from of course the Anaconda repositories and from PyPI you can cache all those things in and then you can hit it with all of your standard tools and it looks as if you're hitting the outside cloud, but it really is inside your corporate environment. IT has a chance to basically go and say, uh, this package, GPL, no bueno, that package, yes, you're ready to roll with that in production. So there's a lot of nice features there. And of course we do run it in air gap environments too, which is some of the you know, most heavily regulated environments are air gapped and we can ship you uh, on offline media, we can ship you the package updates. So anyway, um, and also if you're in government and certain kinds of agencies, you know, um, we, we do have, uh, there's some availability of this already inside those kinds of environments. So just contact us at Anaconda, reach out and, um, and uh, we can get y'all set up. So then, oh, the last thing that, before I got to my cool slide there. Um, so then a third pillar of what makes um, open source and you know, open source Python difficult in regulated environments is culture. So we talked about people, tech, culture. Um, uh, open source, from what I can tell, is still kind of new in regulated environments, which is odd because they all run Linux, right? But <laughs> the idea of open innovation and like a ton of nerds actually like geeking out on stuff and just using it straight up, that's kind of a new thing. Um, and and it, was, uh, it was a learning for me, honestly, because look, I've been doing open source and uh, Linux kinds of things since 95. Um, and I was involved in the, the first open source versus proprietary wars back then, right? Um, part of the Slashdot mob and all that stuff, uh, hating on Larry Ellison and Bill Gates were the best of them. And, um, and I thought that this had basically gotten settled when essentially everybody under the sun started using um, Linux and started using Apache. And then we started using open source languages to power the next generation of you know, great web companies and e-commerce and all that stuff. Turns out, no, actually in corporate environments, there's still a whole lot of like, I talk to people, they're fanboys, they're champions. They're like, yeah, listen, we wanna bring you guys in, but we're still running a lot of pushback because like corporate IT doesn't really get open source, right? And, and this is the same, same thing is true when I talk to like Gartner, right? Gartner does not understand open source and Gartner advises all the CIOs. So of course the CIOs are not gonna get good information from them. So this is the, the reality here is that the grassroots revolution that happened in open source infrastructure stuff, that's happening now higher up the value chain in higher end software, right? And that's, that's y'all are part of the revolution as users, as attendees of PyData events, you're part of that. Um, and I would encourage you to, you know, fight the good fight, keep, keep showing up, keep making the case for it. But, you know, I literally hear these kinds of arguments about, well, I mean, if anyone can just submit code to this thing, how do you know it's any good? It's like, well, anyone can go and get hired by a proprietary, proprietary vendor and submit code and there won't be even other people reviewing it. It just goes in, right? And it literally is like, hey, 90, 1996 is calling, you know, they like the arguments back. They like their FUD back because it's literally the same arguments we heard 96 now showing up against the open source uh, data science stuff. It's just the oddest thing in the world. And what I would do in these cases and these kinds of arguments is I just point to the companies that are doing the most cutting edge work. And the truth is all the innovation happening in data science, all the innovation happening in machine learning and AI, it's all happening in the open. And it is the, the, most, the most visceral example I can, I can picture, I can paint for you is if all of you have seen, hopefully everyone here has seen, has seen the movie Monsters, Inc. If not, spoiler alert, um, you might wanna cover your ears or something, or I guess you can't mute me, but you know, rip out your earbuds or something. But, um, but you know, Monsters, Inc. at the end when they discover that laughter is more energetic, produces more energy than, than scaring kids, right? Open source is basically clued into the same thing. We've like twigged onto the fact that if you get a lot of people working on innovation stuff together, it actually moves faster and you find things in parallel and you, you see some of the good ideas and you go. Um, you have to have architectures that make the innovation simpatico with the existing stuff. Otherwise you're just constantly rebuilding the world. But if you have that infrastructure and you have those APIs, you can do 
parallelized distributed innovation in an amazing speed. This is one of the reasons why ML and AI has been going, growing as fast as it has been because of the open source foundations. Proprietary vendors cannot do this, right? The energy is trapped. The brains are just what's in the room, what's in the, in the firm. Um, with open source, it's all the smart people in the room. A, a really um, interesting story is back in the day, this was probably five years ago, and, um, <clears throat> and we were doing, uh, we had employed, you know, we had uh, first hired some of the Pandas devs at uh, Anaconda, well, then Continuum Analytics. And, um, and they were talking and there was just like hushed whispers of this like amazing random kid in Japan who was pushing these amazing uh, PRs. And it's like, yeah, and like the guy was, he's amazing. I actually, when I went to PyCon Japan and I met him, we chatted for a while, he's a really cool dude. His, his, um, and his, he was able to contribute, right? And then SciPy back in the day, a uh, good friend of mine, Robert Kern, was contributing all these incredibly insightful um, um, bug fixes and the subversion, and he was on the mailing list, super active. And we reached out to him to do some work for us. This is when I was at Nthought. Um, it turns out he was still in like high school. He was about to go <laughs> enter his freshman year at Caltech. And so it's that kind of thing. And I have anecdotes like that, you know, just uh, so many in the entire space of what's made PyData possible. The entire history of that has been people building on each other's work. And it's a global community, and it's so amazingly wonderful that wisdom of the crowds, like Cory Doctorow would be proud of what we've done with this crowdsource innovation. And this is the story to be told, right? When you talk to uh, the stodgy people internally about, well, I, don't know, I paid a million dollars for that stuff. And it's like, well, yeah, you got suckered because you didn't need to, right? That kind of thing, we're still fighting these fights, but in a new domain now. And it's just important to drive to people's understanding. Open source is not about getting a cheaper couple of dudes, put it together in the garage so we get really cheap. It's actually, this is where all the cool stuff is happening. This is the cool party and it's just free. It's just, it's just out there, right? That's a really important point to drive home to, um, to the CIOs who are, again, they're getting their sense making done by Gartner, which can't even spell open source. So, and has never been able to spell open source. Um, and if any of you work for Gartner, by the way, and you want to talk to me about how to think about open source, happy to have the conversation. But all evidence I can see from the outside is that, you know, people in those analyst communities they, they don't really understand how open source and how open source innovation works. So anyway, I identify three kind of the three categories of problems, tech, people, and culture. I'll talk about three solutions, okay? People. So this is going to be a little bit Machiavellian, but seriously, data scientists, y'all are new. Um, don't be Pollyannas. Don't be naive. Understand you got to put on a suit. Understand that you got to make friends. You got to troll your enemies. Um, you cannot expect that just because you're in a hot practice area and the budgets are flowing today, that they will flow tomorrow. And worse, when budgets flow, it attracts a lot of flies. So you will get a lot of, a lot of wannabes, a lot of posers, a lot of, especially in the middle management level, people will be like, all of a sudden, oh, well, I'm an AI thought leader. And they'll show up and it's like, dude, you can't even, you can't even use a Jupyter notebook to like run a basic regression. How are you an AI thought leader? But, but their LinkedIn says they are. And so you gotta be really careful. I want the people who are the legit, credible practitioners to have great career prospects. Part of that is understanding how you're gonna get sniped by other people, right? So just be very clueful, be politically shrewd. It doesn't happen very often in business that a new practice area opens up, that gets a lot of budget, a lot, a lot of executive air cover. Take advantage of that, make friends, but hold yourselves together and, and definitely have, you should build a, build a good culture that can culturally reject, have immune rejection of the posers. Anyway, maybe that's a little bit Machiavellian, but those of you who've been there, have played this game, know what I'm talking about. Um, in tech, okay, so the other thing to recognize in tech is that Python is here to stay. You know, some people ask, oh, what's the next new thing? Because I get this question too. It's like, well, last year was Hadoop, then it was Spark, now this year it's Python, what's next year? Is it, is it Go, is it, is it Julia, what is it? Um, look, Python is here to stay, it's not going anywhere. Once you've taught literally tens of millions of people who are trad not traditional programmers, how to, how to write a language or how to spell their ideas in a language, they're not going anywhere. As long as we don't make their lives completely terrible, they're here for the long haul, right? Why do so many grad programs still have people, new young undergrads coding in Fortran? It's just, that's what their advisors learned in the seventies, right? And that's the kind of dynamic. I mean, I don't think we can just ride on that and pretend it's gonna be all gravy if we just let things slide. But the point is that people, um, there is enough of a mass, such a critical mass around Python that it's just here to stay. And it's not just in data science, it's everywhere. Whether you're doing MicroPython embedded, whether you're doing scripting some game engine, whatever it is, if you're doing web dev, Python's a very good choice for that. Across the board, Python is here to stay. Um, 
the second thing to recognize about that tech is that uh, Python is going to be the preferred language for doing high performance computing, which sounds odd because you're like, well, isn't that C or isn't that Fortran? Well, unless C++, well, it's not C because let's, let's be honest, like unless you're writing low level libraries, you're not doing C. You're probably doing C++. C++ is revving itself every three years. It's becoming a more and more complex and arcane language. Um, and I say this is a C++ fanboy from 20 years ago, but at the end of the day, the applications of high-end computing, um, all those areas that it's getting applied are areas where people are going to need to rev ideas very quickly. And you can rev your ideas faster in Python and be at that Pareto limit or be at the Pareto boundary for revving ideas quickly and getting basically good enough performance. I'm not leaving, I'm not leaving 100x, 100x performance on the table, then we're fine, right? If I'm leaving 15% performance on the table, but I'm able to build a new model every week, I'm good, right? So I think Python will be at that Pareto boundary. will probably drive the Pareto boundary for quite some time to come. Um, so anyway, but at the same time, do stay honest and stay up to speed on industry best practices relative to raw performance. Flops per watt do matter, especially as we get into being able to rent massive scale GPU farms. Flops per watt do matter. So do deepen your knowledge of that stuff if you can. And lastly, on culture, one thing I've seen work really well in a lot of companies is that there'll be a few pockets of Python or data science getting pulled into different parts of the org. Um, take advantage of any opportunity you have, especially while it's harder now COVID, maybe it's easier COVID because everyone's virtual, but um, connect with other people, find, you know, uh, brown bag lunches, or if there is like a Python user group internally, find those people, connect with them, take an active role in that, and just be on the mailing list and the Slack, sharing, sharing talks and meetups, things like that. Build a culture. Basically, if you want to win the culture war, build a culture. So I want to encourage everyone to be thinking, you know, along those lines. Um, the other thing you learn through the through the such grapevines is you might find other groups that have managed to successfully procure things for end users, right? And you can learn a lot from there. So you don't have to do all those learnings yourself. Because again, because data science is a relatively new practice area, a lot of new data scientists don't know how to procure, how to navigate the, the corporate and the legal sort of like stuff. So you can find allies there. Those are some solutions. And so I'll quickly run through then some thoughts on visualization. Are we good? Is that thumbs up? Paolo, how are we doing? Yes? Okay. Thoughts on visualization. Let me have another chug. This is where my opinions come from. It's liquid opinions, okay? Although I'm not trying to promote alcoholism, by the way. Drink responsibly. So thoughts on visualization. So I was, I was asked to sort of like, hey, can you, now that it's COVID time, surely we've seen some really bad COVID vids, right? So let's go, Peter, can you go like just throw your popcorn at some bad vids? And I thought that that would be simply too easy of a target because there have been so many bad vids about COVID. So I want to give, you know, again, for a practitioner community here, I wanted to up-level the conversation a little bit. And let's, let's have some real talk about some meaningful things we can do, all of us, like lessons we can learn about how to present data. Because this is a really important aspect of, um, you know, making friends and, and, and broadening your, your um, business impact. So let's look at this chart. This actually, I think, is from the CDC. And this is a simple, it's just a map of, um, uh, number of cases by state in the, in the country. Um, there's nothing like, this is a common chart. There's nothing glaringly wrong with it. However, there are a number of things that I think are suboptimal about this. Number one, um, they decided rather than using a, a scalar gradient of color, they decided to use categoricals and have relatively arbitrary binnings of those categories, right? So you can tell from looking at this that California and Texas and um, um, I guess Georgia and Florida and, and New York, they, they are the hot areas. You can sort of see those are the brightest or the, the darkest red. Um, but there's no, there's no way to tell between those, you know, which one is worse or are they worse or whatever. And there's, because look, if you look at the, the actual range here, let's, let's, the other thing to look at this is, <laughs> look at the ranges on the color chart here. Uh, you use one of your bars. There's six colors. So you use one of the colors to represent zero to 4,500. At the hot end of the bar, you use one bar to represent 101, uh, 191,000 to 524,000. Okay. So if you look at this, and I'm a I'm pretty good math guy, although I can't quite do logarithms in my head. I don't know. Maybe this is a log scale. I don't know. But it certainly doesn't seem right that you would use and, and if you think about what they're doing here, the reason why I have the zero to 4,600 or so, not the reason, but, but the only states that fall into that color 
are Maine, Vermont, um, I guess Wyoming, and um, uh, 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 yeah, Montana, and you've got like, you got over here Alaska, right? The states that have the least, you know, impact, they get a whole bar there versus the hottest, the hot zones, you can't see the gradation at all. So if you're gonna use color gradations, use color gradations, use a scalar. Otherwise, if you're gonna make categories, that's fine too, and I get it. Um, for, for reasons of UX and why, you know, a, a less sophisticated viewer might find categorical uh, colorations to be more accessible. But then pick the categories in a meaningful way, and more importantly, show the histogram of why you built the bins the way you did, right? Because that's a more honest thing. That doesn't make it look like you're trying to hide a whole bunch of stuff. Um, the second thing is perceptual uniformity, right? So this is something that is really important anytime you use color. So if this were a uh, monochrome, well, I guess it is monochrome technically, but if, you, if it was on a scale of uh, just black to white, that would be one thing. So it'd be grayscale. So if it was a grayscale thing, that'd be fine. The instant you introduce hue into this, now you get into a uh, area known as sort of psychovisual analysis. Now you got to understand, does the eye respond in a different nonlinear way to gradations of red versus green versus blue or purple or cyan or whatever? The instant you put a color on something, you might think it's a relatively arbitrary aesthetic choice, but actually there is, if you want the end user to actually have a um, perceptually accurate understanding of the data, then you need to take the actual value of the color into account. So anyway, this is a deep and rich area, not something I can spend a lot of time on, but it's something that just to be aware, anytime you use color or not grayscale, go and understand what the visual impact of that color is and how the gamma scale actually impacts the end users for that color. The thing I really want to nerd out on is this is a map, but what we're showing is dead people. The land didn't die. The land didn't test positive or negative for coronavirus, right? The land is just land, but the visual impact, the pixels, the raw pixels we have is, is proportionate to land mass, which is not the right thing to do. And especially in election year, we're going to see a whole lot of this. Every time you see an election map like this or broken down by territory or county, you can just see my head exploding. Every time you see a map with colors in it, picture my head exploding. Picture the inside of this cowboy hat filled with blood because I hate that. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. It's such a simple, simple, but crucial mistake whenever we visualize data. I understand that it's important just for the end user to get the, the 2D map anchoring of different parts of the country. And there are absolutely political correlations with different parts of the country, right? There's geographic correlations. We want the things to be roughly relative to each other in space, but scaling up the actual value of what you're showing based on land mass and not the actual underlying data is error number zero, error number one. It's hugely bad. So use hex bins like the New York Times here or in the upper right, I think it's called Geofacet. It's an R library by a guy I know, Ryan Hathen, uh, smart dude, really nice, right? You can facet geographically. People still get a rough sense of geography or on the left, you scale based on the, you scale area on the basis of actual count. Um, anyway, you need to clearly tell, you know, I'm pretty, you know, this is something that really does trigger me. Um, okay, next visualization. This is a log scale showing, well, this is a couple of things, right? It shows the positivity rate in color and it shows on the log scale on the left, um, the rolling seven day average of new cases. I don't know what the data is on this, so don't, don't, don't assume this is like recent today, please. This is just a, a, a picture I picked up, but it's representative of several I've seen like this. And um, so number one, I'll point out log scales. For those of us who are quantitatively inclined, of course, we know what logarithms are. We can probably spell the word logarithm. 99% of the American population cannot. So if you're going to, if you want, you know, in all cases with this, think about what it is you're trying to get the end user to understand. Think about the story you're trying to tell. And if you require, absolutely have to show a log scale, I mean, I guess, but I really wouldn't recommend using log scales for people who are not quantitatively literate because it gives them, again, like with the, um, the linear versus gamma mapping of color and saturation, it gives them the wrong idea. They look at a linear axis and they assume it's linear. They really do. It's just terrible. If you have an exponential curve, show the exponential. And for, I mean, in the, in the, if you have to show some more detail there, show two exponentials and show how, yeah, they're both really bad. 
So we can't see the difference in them visually. So we're gonna apply a log transformation and now you see the difference in them. But at least hit them with the visual impact of it is an exponential curve. Like it's an exponential curve, right? If you do a log scale, the people are like, oh, but it's like, man, it's just a, it's like a line going up. That's like, no, that's doubling every 10 days. That's bad, right? So number the second, this is showing, this is a multi-dimensional visualization. And, and I get it, you know, they want to show, they want to put a pack a lot into a single viz. I would, um, I would recommend um, against doing that if at all possible, because it's already so hard to tell one good story in a complex data set, trying to tell two or three in the same data set is hard. And then additionally, if you look at the, the color axis they used, they used both saturation and they used uh, sort of two different colors, right? Um, one color sort of is below, if you look at the blues and then the oranges, why? Here's the question, why is the 3% uh, positivity rate the break point? Is it better, like if it was below three and worse if it's higher or like, what's the story there? The, if you're gonna do something like that where you have essentially two diverging values in, a, in, a, in any kind of thing, whether it's categorical or scalar, you need to tell a story about why you picked the break point where you did, just like in the first one where you, where you have the bins. You gotta tell the story about why you bin the way you did. Right. Um, lastly, and this is kind of a subtle thing. It's a line chart over time. Anytime you make a line chart over time, the fact that you're connecting dots means you're telling the story about a trend. But what trend are we telling? Because here, are we telling about a trend about positivity rates? Or are we telling a story about a trend of counts? Both are convolved in here. And this is kind of a subtle point, right? Like even people here on the, on the, uh, in the meetup, Y'all are data viz and data uh, analyst, um, you know, practitioners. And if I were to, you know, making that point to you, you have to think about this and say, oh yeah, like what, what is the trend story they're trying to tell with this? What can I actually infer? What story could I write about what's happening in Germany, Italy versus New Zealand versus the US, I guess? Like, you know, these are the things you have to ask yourself anytime you present an infographic. And lastly, I'll end with something which is both good and bad, okay? So this, I would say, this is one of the most devastatingly effective infographics. No labels on the axes, it's fine. Um, but this really made it viscerally obvious to people, I think. It communicated quite a lot to people about why we need to flatten the curve. Just a beautiful, beautiful piece of visual communication, I think. But even with something like this, there's a danger lurking in it, which is you have to consider the audience if we successfully flatten the curve, and this is something that I think very few people were asking about. I, I sort of asked the question about a week after I saw the flatten the curve thing, and I saw that it was starting to really play in the popular press. I said, oh, wait, hold on a second. If we do flatten the curve, the immediate narrative is gonna be that we overreacted, right? And so what this infographic didn't show or didn't sort of pre presage or like didn't get people to immediately say, oh yeah, by the way, we need to also have this other graphic, which is, the number of excess deaths we avoided. No one was telling that story, but if you wanna actually get you know, the, the audience, and this is your job, if you're actually building an infographic to communicate to the audience, your job should be evaluated on the basis of, did the audience understand what you're trying to communicate to them, right? If you actually want the audience to understand what success looks like, you have to paint the picture of success, which is, by the way, when we're successful with this, it's going to look like we overreacted by a lot. No one told that story. And of course it was impossible in the media and politicized environment at the time to tell that story. But ultimately I, I bring this out just as a point to say the left, that infographic saved, probably saved hundreds of thousands of lives in its efficacy and getting people to understand the argument of why we needed to lock down. It was so, so like the non-expert person could understand this. But on the right, our failure to tell the story and for us as kind of data analysts to predict what could happen from a narrative standpoint you know, that's a fail. And that's led, honestly, that led to the second wave because people we were like, oh yeah, it's all good now. It's all good. We're on the decline. Let's go out and party. And now we have a second wave, right? So, um, so then on the idea of good InfoVis, two good InfoVis things that I've seen recently that I'll show. One, very stark um, and, and really just put things in perspective. Um, this is an InfoVis. It's an infographic, probably not like any that you guys have ever created that anyone this call has ever created. But um, it has all what I think are the hallmarks of good info viz, which is it's accessible. It is incredibly compelling because it tells a human story. I, it's me and my mother and my grandmother. Okay, that's, I'm anchored now to the frame of the story this is telling. And I look at these and if they're just stick figures, but yeah, every single person 
up the chain is an unbroken chain. Anyone who's here on the call today is here because there's an unbroken chain of people who work their butts off, probably ran away from tigers and bears, probably scraped through a, scraped through a living in the woods or in some you know barren farm to put you here on this earth. So this is like, for me, it's all the hallmarks of great InfoViz. It tells a story, it connects, it's compelling, um, and it's accurate. It really, well, I assume it's accurate. I didn't actually count all the stick figures. I probably should have. But, um, but if it's inaccurate, it's also an easy fix. Okay, so, but it's just so interesting to show, you know, 500 generations. And I will, la I will end with one, with my favorite infographic I've seen in the recent memory. And also, um, this really tells us why we have so much work to do as the data, as we try to popularize and democratize data science, data analysis. Um, show of hands, how many people on the call know the difference between a million and a billion? right? A billion dollars, a million dollars, good. I think everyone here would know the difference, right? How many of you ever seen a picture like this? Right? There's that, that great uh, quip. What's the difference between a million and a billion? About a billion, right? This is an infographic. This is InfoViz at its finest because it hits you right in the brain about, oh, right. It's like, yeah, of course, right. So it's, it, so it's not really, it doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to tell the exact precise story and make it really connect with the viewer. And they're a little smarter because they saw your thing. So um, anyway, that's, that's it. I, I don't know if I have time for Q&A or what, you know, if we had over or whatever, but. Uh, that was fantastic. So if, um, if anybody needs to leave, of course you can leave. This is a virtual meetup. You don't need our permission, but. Um, I say let's just merge the Q and A with our virtual happy hour. Um, so, since there's only four or six of us, I'm gonna let people ask their own questions. If you guys get unruly, you know, I'll mute you. But, um, just yeah. raise his hand. Yeah. So, hi, okay. Peter. It's a great talk. Thank you again. Um, as a veteran of the language wars of 2015, and I'm really sorry I don't have a, a great Viz question because I know that's what you really wanted to, to talk about. <laughs> anyway, as a veteran of the, the, the language wars, if you were to, to pick or like the rank order from these just three things that have happened that, uh, that, that helped Python the most, uh, to between the cloud, GPUs, and the to Bitcoins, the, you know, the, the whole thing, and to Kubernetes, which one of these three helped Python the most to be where, where it is right now in 2020? So between cloud computing, GPUs, and um, Kubernetes. 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 <laughs> between those three options, I have to say cloud. Cloud. Yeah. And the reason is because uh, it's, it's, a little, it's a, little, a little involved, but my thinking about it is this. If it hadn't been possible for younger startups to scale the SaaS startups to, sorry, software as a service, not SaaS Institute. If it wasn't possible for the software as a service startups in the 2000s to scale and hit success on cloud, they wouldn't have produced the kinds of data sets um, into nouveau architectures they would have gone to classic data warehouses, right? If, I, if, if, if you think about it, if 1990s IT and data architects had gotten a, their hands on one of these rapidly growing scaling companies, um, I don't think the data science movement would have been born. I think it would have just gone into really, really expensive Oracle data warehouses and it would have been a lot more SQL. And, um, you know, and so I think the, the, uh, the availability, so my reasoning is the availability of cloud meant that there were a generation, a mini generation of scalable, hyperscale web 2.0 startups, which produced data sets that then led to the data science revolution. And that, but also Hadoop to some extent. I mean, I would say Hadoop, I, I, you know, in 2012, I was calling it the Hadoop battering ram. Hadoop basically, for all of its warts, it went and destroyed the traditional IT or the traditional enterprise data warehouse model, the Kimball style, like low and slow, low and slow and SQL and everything. Although people end up doing mostly SQL <laughs> with Hive, but it's still like that is what made it possible. And all of that stuff was because of cloud. I think if it wasn't for cloud, all of these things would have to filter in through the traditional, you know, uh, IT corporate, corporate IT funnel and ended up in classic legacy architectures. So 
that's what led to the data science and the big data and the predictive analytics and machine learning revolution. So yes, cloud was by far the biggest thing there. Awesome, thank you. I'm gonna jump in with the, one of the questions I saw in the chat. So um, somebody asked about uh, open source and regulated environments. What are some of the challenges you have run into uh, in air gap and government environments with Conda? And also how do you build an open source community in such a secretive, uh, I guess like environment or culture? Okay, yeah, two good questions. So in the first one, um, if you're trying to use Conda inside an air gap environment, and this is gonna sound really self-serving, but like, please just buy our package server <laughs> because we will get you the mirrors. We'll even, if you have IT policies that don't allow USB sticks, we will ship it to you on DVDs, right? Like it's, it's fine. Um, so that's really the best way to do that. Um, and I would not recommend you try to cobble your own thing together because then you're basically wasting time you should be using to do data analysis to go and try to build your own package server mirror thingy magic or whatever. Just, just buy the thing. Your time is more precious than that. It's not very expensive. Um, and it also gives, the other important thing about it is it gives IT a stake in the game. So IT gets a chance to say, this channel is only available for production. This channel is only available for, uh, this channel is available for dev. IT gets a chance to say which things are flipped over to production. You point the dev servers at dev, so your sandboxes are then wide open. Like it just gets everyone onto a better footing when they're thinking about the software supply chain for data science. And look, open source data science software is not going any, is not going away. It's only going to be more and more of it. So that's my answer to that. Just, just push for that. Um, and also like the way to drive awareness there is tell IT, give them a list of here's all the libraries I need to use. And if you want to spend six months going through every single one, running your scanners and everything else and doing your own bespoke process, you can do that. Or you can just go talk to a company that literally does this for a living to everything from three letter agencies to investment banks in Europe and hedge funds in America and everybody else. So like, that's really the thing I would push there. Sorry, that's my sales pitch. The second thing is how you build um, an open source community within those kind of environments. I would say that um, it's a little more challenging, right? Because everyone is more tight lipped about what they're doing. Um, but if you can find a way to, what I found is even in those environments, there are still plenty of forums to showcase your work. And so what happens is there's sort of a multi-stage process, but if you can find those kinds of venues or you get permission from your group leader or from your manager to talk about some of these things, then in your talk, ask people to reach out to you and, and be a resource to them. Or, you know, like reach out to others if you attend one of their talks. So it becomes a very peer-to-peer -peer bespoke connection, kind of, not bespoke, but uh, individual peer-to-peer -peer kind of connection basis. Um, so you're not spamming the entire org with like, hey, I'm doing a lunch and learn on Python, blah, blah, blah. But through that network, you guys can start forming your own, you know, mailing list or whatever kind of thing. But you have to take the first step, right? You have to actually try to show up and do a presentation, find, you know, of course, get all of the permissions and definitely don't try to ask forgiveness later on these kinds of things, but try to talk about some of the work and talk about the learnings and, and you know what, the kinds of talks that are really welcome in those situations are when you talk about your experiences as a practitioner, getting some of these other tools stood up to talk to various data sources. Those are usually easy to clear because those data sources are well known. People, a lot of people talk to those data sources. You're not talking at all about the analysis you're doing or giving any information about the mission or anything like that. You're just talking about, hey, how do I use the pandas as new geo, you know, how do I use geo pandas? How do I use the pandas new IP based uh, data, data columns to go and process this particular cybersecurity data in this particular thing? And so it becomes very, it becomes less about what you're doing and more about how to use one of the internal corporate things or internal organization things. Those things are extremely valuable and those things go viral very quickly inside. You'll find people reaching out to you because people put on a wiki somewhere or people put on some other thing on a file share. And so that's a really, definitely in the slides, put your contact info in the slides and ask people to reach out to you uh, when you do those kinds of presentations. So anyway, that's my thoughts on that. Awesome. Um... I'm gonna let the silence hang for a second. Maybe people can find uh, the courage to just pipe in. Um, yeah, go ahead, somebody please unmute yourself. Uh, Peter, I got hey, one Mike. for you. Hey, um, thank you for the talk, that was great. Um, thank you. So going back to your, uh, 
your comments uh, or your thread about uh, kind of the IT uh, versus the the data scientist, the platypus data scientist. Um, so, what would you, what advice do you have, or how would you deal with situations where those two worlds are conflicting? In that you have, say, say you've got a model that's gone through like a a, a governance process, it's been put in production, and it's been well measured, it's very well understood it's being monitored to see how performance uh, mm -hmm. changes over time. And then there's a, there's a cybersecurity issue that, that happens within that Docker container that that thing is running and it needs to be changed. It needs to be updated. Yeah. Um, and, and you have this, you then have this conflict between the, uh, the maintainer of that model that, that is well measured and well understood and cybersecurity saying, no, you must update this Docker container. And there's this fear of like, oh, well, I don't know what that's going to do. I'm going to have to go back through my whole process. How do you, how do you, yeah, what advice do you have for those two worlds trying to, to, to work together in the enterprise? Um, my, my overall strategy in any kind of enterprise conflict is, um, is just first starting with the question of when there is a misalignment in, um, objectives between two different persons or groups or whatever. Um, how far up do you have to go up the chain before there is alignment, right? Um, and uh, oftentimes it's, you go up the chain to the level right below the alignment because the two people in charge of driving alignment don't want to tell the person above them that things are misaligned. Okay, you know what I'm saying? So that's, so that's usually how you work that up. Um, now, in a lot of cases, you know, Everyone is trying to do the right thing. IT just has their policies they're trying to put in place. And then, you know, you all try and do your thing as well. And so you just have to get, so then it becomes a game of like, who can, who can pull in the SVP first onto the call kind of thing, you know, some of these kinds of games. But um, ultimately, it's like any negotiation then. Um, it's, it's better if you can first show a good alternative, right? And a good alternative might be to say, well, let's do this. We can immediately roll because in our Docker container, it's not opaque because we use Conda to manage the environments. It's easy for us to just update that one package and see what else it will impact. And we looked at it and the team looked at it and said, Hey, you know what? I think this is actually a fairly trivial update to, to, to resolve this particular thing. Um, and I don't think it'll affect actually any of the model scoring. So let's do that and let's roll a parallel container. And let's A-B test. Let's, let's take a 10th of or a hundredth of the traffic off and see if our performance on that is good. Right. Um, and I might say that you, you know, roll forward that way. And then IT can say, okay, that's a meaningful step to remediating this, right? Because all they, not all they need to do, but they want to show that you're, you want to show them you're not an impasse, that you also want to solve for remediation, but your concerns are these things. Because, and this is again, a bit of corporate hacking for those on the call who are interested in learning these kinds of skills. If you're the first to show up with a metric, now you've anchored the conversation, Right. You're like, if model performance does not drop off by this percentage over this period of time, then we're okay to flip this off and go put all the traffic on this container. And now you've just like, you've just like dropped it on the table. You're like, boom. Okay, IT, what's your measure of what the cost and the risk is to the business? You ain't got one? Okay, well, this is what we're going to do then, I guess, right? So, because this is, this is, if you think about the people one or two levels above who are going to be the adult supervision that gets called in, if you guys can't resolve the conflict, they're going to be solving for this exact same thing. Like, well, does anyone have a solution? And you're like, well, we have a solution. Here's our proposal. <laughs> and, you know, so just, I mean, all are data people, right? You know that all the way up the chain, it's data driven. So if you can show those kinds of things. Now, the second thing is solve it twice, right? This is a practice of software, solve it twice. So the first time this happens to you, see if this actually plays in your org. If, it, if IT is amenable, find a, you know, if it works, then what you can do is next time you build your model, um, you know, build in some safeguards. So think about ways that like, if we can identify libraries or parts of like the things we use that are critical path for the scoring and any other CVEs that touch other stuff, we, we have a low risk of blowing things up if we update those things, right? Um, Cause presumably not everything in the container all hangs delicately on the thread and funnels into the prediction scoring. Very little actually does, right? There's mostly a production risk issue and risk exposure issue. Um, Oh, the, the, other, the other thing in there is data science is a service, usually a service center to other lines of business. Get the line of business stakeholder involved because they have budget, right? Usually they're the ones driving revenue. They're driving budget. 
if you as a data scientist show a way to remediate this and you have performance and things like that, you can do some sensitivity analysis on the model. You can say, look, you know, you can basically sort of um, play that game pretty well if you do that, if you get the, the line of business involved. Now, that being said, again, solving it twice, in the future, um, it would be great if you could do some, some initial sensitivity analysis on the model to say, well, if we tweak, if we, if we shunt this percentage of the traffic off, that's a safe thing to do and it will not impact our overall performance. And we can do that to do our security testing or what, what not. I don't know if that makes sense, but in some cases that's possible. And in some cases, just doing random, you know, tapping off is not actually the best thing to do. You want to do it in other cases because you have some, some portion of your traffic doesn't matter as much and you just want to use those as tests. I don't know. I'm, I'm now throwing a bunch of ideas out there, but, but that would be my idea is basically look to see if you can offer the remediation approach and, and do something like that. But that's essentially the life everyone's going to be living. I mean, that's the only way to do this realistically anyway. IT is just going to have to get used to it. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, any other questions? I see a few faces. Uh, yeah. All right, I think, so Ben Mendes has been posting a bit. He says, um, uh -huh. most software developers program in half a dozen or more different languages mm -hmm. over their career. Uh, some will use a half dozen language just in one role. Tools change, right. paradigms change, but programming doesn't really change. I guess it's not a question, but good comment. Mm -hmm. He did have a, uh, Ben did have a question a little bit earlier about, and okay. I think this is when you were talking about uh, open source management in regulated environments. He said mm -hmm. that the dev world has solved these issues for years. Mm -hmm. Why not adopt dev solutions when compared to, I guess, like Conda uh, teams? Um, yes, yeah, so this here, where is it? Uh, oh, this is, oh, there's a lot of discussion about the maps, right? Um, so he's saying here, co coconut is next thing. So where is this? I'm trying to find the, uh, where is it the dev tools or the dev community has solved this for years? I see a lot of different comments here in the chat. Oh, I see. The dev world has solved these issues for years. Why not adopt dev solutions? Um, I, I don't know exactly specifically. Is Ben, is ben still on? Uh, yeah, maybe Ben could unmute. Uh, ben, can you maybe give us a little bit more clarification on your question? Yeah, what, what is the these that you're referring to, the, these, these issues? So I want to make sure I'm um, speaking to the right question. Maybe he stepped away from the computer for a minute. Yeah, maybe he's away from the keyboard. All right. Uh, who's next? Does anybody else have a question? Go for it, Dee. Uh, you're on Oh, mute. you're muted. OK. Hi, Peter. You mentioned the need for the new organizational structure with emphasis of the open source development, of, uh, focus on uh, data science uh, development. In Europe, it's very popular the role of analytics translator, the people that uh -huh. really bridge uh, the need to translate the business requirements and data science modeling itself. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that role anywhere in the United States. Do you, I mean, I may be wrong, but I think I have a really good picture, I mean, of the industry, I mean, specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about that? And how do you huh. fill that gap? And that That's interesting. That so what is, output, uh, what is the output, what is the output of the, uh, two questions, what is the output of the business translator's work? Like do they produce a spec to give to the, or they model out a problem, the to, to scope the problem, yes. and then um, the business cases for data science solutions. Right, and then what are they responsible for ultimately? If the data scientist produces a model, are they responsible for vetting the model accuracy? Or are they responsible for making sure it gets plumbed into production? No, the, the analytics translator are not technical roles at all. They understand ah. both environments, the business and the technical environment, and then they bridge together this in creating the business model, okay. how the data science will be utilized best for the business objective needs. Got it. Yeah, so I can, um, I think, 
I think maybe that title is not used, but I certainly see people in that role. I would say that senior data science leads often play that role, almost like a product manager for the data science project team, not project manager, product manager. Like what is the ultimate analytical product we're building, right? And so it falls on them, usually falls on them to understand the business, to talk to the corresponding senior business leaders and to get that input in. Um, I, I don't know, I haven't done a lot of reading into this or, or sorry, a lot of um, study into it, but I do see that, you know, some of my senior data science friends and whatnot, this is a large part of their job. It's basically mentoring and onboarding the data scientist staff. And then two, really helping to translate the business need into the, what is possible in the scope. So, so they play a hybrid of like a product manager and architect role, right? right. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't know why that doesn't emerge as a separate, well-established role here. I mean, I do think really, I stand by my statement that oh, from what I see data science in, in like traditional, let's say on the other side of the chasm, like in mainstream business, mm -hmm. um, data science is still nascent in there. And so maybe in that area, um, we will see more of those roles emerge. I, I don't really know, but um, from my discussions with data science uh, teams and data scientists, it seems like the data science team lead usually takes on that role. Uh, I don't know if others have perspectives on that. But. Yeah, I asked the question simply when you talk about the culture, people and technology and the need really to create a new organizational structure specifically to focus on that. And mm -hmm. I thought that, I mean, that kind of role really fits uh, really well in this new structures that are needed. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think the thing is, the role is there, even if the title isn't, right? So like someone is doing that job, you have to, even if you're a single lone freelancer data scientist, you're kind of wearing that hat probably half the time, right? It is interesting though, your observation, I, I'll ask around about that in Europe, that, that that role explicitly shows up more. That's great. Maybe, is it, maybe it's a continuation of some previous role that got repurposed. Maybe because Europe, one thing I do know is that Europe tends to be much more of a consultancy and consultative driven IT environment. So it's possible that businesses already had someone in that role of translating their business needs to software dev needs. And so then for data science projects, it's the same function. It's just an output port, not an output port, but an interface, right? So that interface role is already there maybe in Europe because they're so consultative in their IT operations. I don't know. So I'm gonna, McKinsey did, did an article on this and I'm gonna post the link. Exactly, uh -huh. that role. I think that's super Great. interesting. I'd love to know what that role is called because- Analytics we, translator. <laughs> exactly analytics that. translator? Yeah. Yeah, because we call it like being good at storytelling, right? In, in, <laughs> in my world, in my world, that's the tech lead. That, that's the tech lead putting on the, the, the hat of the product owner and trying to distill the, the, um, the business use case down to like a software spec that the engineers can deliver on or can 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 act on right yeah that's really interesting i still think so my my general feeling on this uh and this is outside the scope of the talk i gave today but it's it's one it's something i talk about quite a bit and i deeply deeply it's a point of view that i'm very passionate about which is that the tools we're building um ideally uh will be accessible to everyone um, my, I've taught my son how to do basic math sorts of things in, in uh, Python and he's, you know, he's 10 now, but I taught him when he was like eight. Um, and I think that the world we're moving into is going to be just swimming in data and models and prediction and cybernetics. So it is incredibly important for every single person to have some facility in terms of understanding the technology, understanding how to reason about it. I talk about it as data literacy. It's really modeling literacy, computational literacy, what have you. Um, and the thing I see is that there will be a very tall cliff separating the people who can and the people who can't. Right now, that cliff isn't very large. So you use a translator as a ladder to get up and down that thing. Over time, the companies where the VPs can pop up a Jupyter Notebook and actually hop in there and start poking at stuff, poking at stuff. You know, the, the, the new entry data scientists today are gonna to be the VPs 10 years from now. It's gonna happen. So, um, 
So that world, the companies that can do that, they're going to be able to reason with each other and operate at such a fantastically faster level than those who can't. They will naturally win. The natural Darwinian, corporate Darwinism will select for the companies that can do this. And in fact, it already has been in a sense, right? And so I think what will happen is the companies, that any surviving organism or firm, if you will, is going to have to have the discipline that yeah, at some level you need to be data literate. Now, what I don't want is an asymmetry between the corporate world and the individuals, right? I want every person to also have an embodied ability and literacy over the kinds of models that are driving policy, public policy, budget decisions, all sorts of things. I think it's super important. So as a civilization, we need to upgrade. Just as we upgraded, everyone learned Arabic to be able to write numbers and everyone learned how to do basic math because you need to, right? Imagine if you had to go and talk to a translator to understand why your electric bill adds up the way it does. You wouldn't be able to, this, we would not have modern society the way we do. Because we give everyone reading, writing, arithmetic, we are able to have an upgraded society. I think computational numeracy is just one of those things. Um, as we live in a cybernetic world, if we don't, we'll live in a very draconian dystopian future where the people who can will be the haves and the people who can't will be serfs, informational serfs. So that's why I'm so passionate about democratizing this data literacy to everyone, why these tools will always be free if I have anything to say about it. Um, because everyone needs to learn how to do these things. Um, I think we've got somebody else. Uh, let's see. I think Isan Katir might have had uh, a question or something he wanted to say to the group. Isan, are you able to unmute yourself? Yes, yes. Thanks very much, Paul. And great talk. Thanks very much. I learned a lot. Thank you. Uh, I'm in Davis, California, and um, had a wonderful Python programmer in Montevideo, Uruguay, who was uh, doing work for me on a browser-based ID called Quant Connect. And, um, uh -huh. but then he got a real job and uh, can't do my stuff anymore. So I'm just putting the word out. Apollo said I could do that. I appreciate that. Um, if anyone's Great. interested in um, machine learning for uh, applica applications for uh, investment and trading. Um, oh, interesting. To connect. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. So there you go, guys. Reach out to Isan. Um, and Isan, feel free to post something in the meetup uh, board. I think we will just, that. okay. Yeah. I just put, put it in chat to everyone. Sure. Yeah, that works too. Um, Peter, uh, Majid, the, I, I love this discussion about how, because I've seen it before. I even, I think I saw like a Medium article that said data scientists, uh, or like the title is dead, right? Like data science is going to become like a basic core competency from here on out. And I think like my knee jerk reaction was, there's no way, no, nobody can do what I can do, right? Like this is so complicated. <laughs> but then I thought about it and I was like, we're not going to run out of complicated math to learn, right? Like, <laughs> like, yes, let's teach everybody. Like, let's give everybody this literacy. We're not going to run out of innovation. In fact, it's hard to keep up with uh, the innovation. So yeah. I think it's a really good point. about. Well, I would think about it this way. Everyone yeah. can read and write. Doesn't mean that we don't have people who are professional authors, That's right? Good. And even within business, the people who can write better generally do a little better, right? Yeah. So it is a skill just like any other literacy. It is a social good when everyone can do it. And then there are gonna be some people who do it better than others and they're going to have more professional access because they can do certain things better than others. Um, I think the same is true for data modeling and data analysis. Three questions if I can. Yeah. Or three related questions slash topics. Uh, first one is to Peter, thanks for the talk. Um, Thank you. Can you give us a status update on how what I like to call uh, Python kind of growing up and being kind of big data native. What's the status mm -hmm. on that? Um, Dask, I mean, Dask continues to chug along um, and being big data native is, uh, it depends, I mean, it depends really by what you mean by that. Um, do you mean scale out? It just works out of the box. Do you mean uh, multi-core and gill free sort of things? Do you mean like, what is the, can you give me a sense of the scope? I'll leave the above. I'll leave the above. Okay. Can you avoid, for example, Spark? <laughs> yeah. Just stick with, you know, Pandas kind of data frame, uh, not even, it's just the, the data frame general API mm -hmm. without having to think about how Absolutely. to execute it. I mean, Rapids and da Dask, and Rapids is a great example of how Dask can scale out and down at the same time. I think we talk about scale up and scale out, right? 
uh, number gives you scale up. Um, and then DAS gives you scale out. That's been our story for probably seven years now, eight years, or no, six years, let's be honest, six, five or six years. Um, but, um, but I think that the, the Ravis team, uh, probably better than any other, has, has demonstrated the completion of that story, right? Where, yeah, you want one GPU, you can go up. You want lots of GPUs, you go out. And you're still writing the same kind of code. Um, sure. and, and frankly, you know, at some point, there's big and there's big enough. Right, the kinds of data sets you can tackle with Rapids on a cluster of GPUs is big enough for a lot of people. Right, when we look at some of the work we've been doing with Pangeo, if you guys are interested in how Dask can scale up to, ter to multi terabyte size data sets very naturally, that's what the Pangeo folks are doing. Um, right, and in fact, I think they're pulling together something like a 200 petabyte data warehouse on Amazon uh, for na for oceanographic data that they'll be dealing, they'll be hitting with Jupiter and Dask. Um, so I don't, I mean, I, I think this idea that there was a brief period when we we're playing catch up on the on the scale out game. I think at this point, yeah, there's some really good stuff. Das Gateway. I mean, there's still some new things being built, but if you have native S3 data, we have a native S3. Actually, I think in in intake we just merged a native S3 Excel reader, so you can actually load Excel data files off of S3. Scale out to your heart's content, you know. Um, so, so it's some good stuff going on there. That's your uh, intake plug. <laughs> It's the, it's the sleeper. It's the sleeper that's going to make this stuff really sing. I think people will really get a kick out of it because we're moving post PC and the POSIX file system is probably the last thing to, to fall because of course data is precious. And so the file system is going to be the last bastion of that computing model. But once you move to be able to have a very, very thin Python kernel, possibly web assembly running, you know, client, whatever. And all that has to do is connect to a different kind of file system interface. You're, you're home free, you know? So anyway, um, my other question is on the kind of the effect of Docker. So yes, it has made a deployment very simple, but what I'm noticing is that it allows people to be lazy. Mm -hmm. And like, I just see Docker files where they're, it's basically, they're just, it's just kind of the path of least resistance to yeah. get something uh, re re reproduced. Oh, I'm going to con install this. Oh, because Conda doesn't have it. I'm going to pip install it. Oh, I'm going to, then I'm going to, use I'm gonna use the uh, base image from that other thing and I'm gonna mash it all yep. together there you go that's my environment yep so that's that's kind of uh, my concern about it because you know you can make things so easy then you you should really be doing package management from the very start mm -hmm. I think it's about transparency well sorry what's your question uh, yes yeah, so th that's well it's kind of a comment. Um, <laughs> if you're trying to troll me to hitting on Docker, it won't work. <laughs> I've built up troll resistance since we've last spoken. <laughs> I would say this. I think that it is unreasonable to expect data scientists to learn DevOps and sysadmin. Like I, I come from a sysadmin background. I was adminning machines for a long time. Um, it is unreasonable to expect them to understand that layer of the stack. However, there are a few principles that are worth porting over into the data science practice. One of them is that configuration should be declarative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, number one. Number two, re reproducibility ain't nothing. Maintainability is the key thing. Reproducibility is a means possibly to maintainability, but ultimately if you're not responsible for maintaining and you, then you don't understand the pain of what an opaque reproduction process actually is, right? So I think some of these are just, um, you know, maybe someone needs to write like, a, you know, there's like the pragmatic programmer and then like um, uh, clean coder books. Someone needs to have a clean data scientist book or something like that about basic principles. Look, no one's asking you to be a sysadmin, but here's some basic principles that have worked for 20 years because they're right. Um, just do it this way. Avoid the temptation to write a bunch of opaque scripts. You know, uh, you don't get to go home and give yourself a pat on the back just because you ran a command and it worked right? It's about when you six months from now, or God forbid, some chump that inherits your job runs six months from now. Like, that's what it means to be a responsible practitioner, right? So these are the kinds of things that are, you know, they're, they're well known in software development, but people are sloppy with software too. And they still ship and they still IPO and they make lots of money. So, you know, at the end of the day, without descending into a, I have, I've only had just one can of beer without descending into a rant about what capital does for tech laziness, I will, um, you know, leave it at that. <laughs> and that, because that also leads into my next question. Um, 
So, you know, because when you're in a, some kind of organization, especially if it's profit driven, you know, you want the result ASAP, right? Mm -hmm. If you get that result, it's almost like, okay, you know, I don't need to use uh, con environments, you know, because I pipped installed this and I con installed that. And, you know, this uh, little bug that you just kind of uh, didn't address directly in the uh, open source package, you just kind of put in your little fix in, in the uh, production code, you know, that, that doesn't get rewarded. Like, and that, that's been my experience. So, hey, I, I should, you know, please give me the time so that I can actually fix this in the package, you know, make a, make a proper PR. But, uh, you know, in the interest of just getting something done, mm -hmm. that doesn't happen and it's not rewarded. Yeah. yeah. So I would say it's a matter of, it's again, sort of what my answer to, to Mike earlier about what happens when your goals with IT conflict, right? Solve for the alignment of value. If you work for a company and they're paying you to basically put a roof over your head and put bread on the table, your values are not necessarily 100% misaligned with theirs, right? You are also aligned with their profit motive. However, you have additional values that are higher dimensional and do not project into maybe a very one dimensional <laughs> value system within the corporation. So then your job is to figure out how to expose those values, translate them into a way that makes sense for the, for the organization. Um, and usually uh, organizations look at things from a very simple perspective. The roll up is either capital expenditure or operational expenditure or risk exposure, right? So if you can project your concerns and values and encapsulate them and communicate them in a way that projects into those three bases, now you have a talking point. Now you have something to talk about, right? But certainly maintaining the integrity of some open source project out of the goodness of your heart, you know, no CFO really can be bothered with that because lots of people, and this is not because they're bad, but because they do represent essentially a condensation point or a focal point, right? Lots of different values and concerns are pulling in 25 different directions. So you would, um, you know, who are you to say that spending, you know, funding an extra 20% time to maintain an open source project um, is more valuable than funding some diversity initiative over here, right? Or some other philanthropic thing over here or doing this thing over here. Like there's all these different things that can happen. So ultimately you have goals that are higher dimensional and beyond the scope of the organization can understand. Then the battle is this, whoever can articulate their values in the context and in the basis vectors of the organization, the best wins. Right. Thanks. And one kind of pie in the sky question. Do you think uh, we will ever arrive at a point where the technology aspect of, you know, all this data science will disappear? No more dealing with compilers, no more dealing with Kubernetes and packages. Uh, all, you know, it's just maybe you live in notebook land and uh, it's just SQL and, uh, and Python that just knows how to configure itself under the hood. <laughs> yes, I, th I would like to get us to that point. I would like to get us to a point where, uh, in fact, at the last um, PyData, the NumFocus Summit in New York in October, I was um, uh, a batting around some crazy ideas with Anthony Scopatz about what uh, web import means, right? And being able to dynamically have every package available always. And you just write some code, you know, and you, now there's no free lunch and computers are not yet telepathic. So you still have to articulate what you're expecting out of the API when you wrote the code. But nonetheless, this idea of doing package management is absolutely tied to the state of Python at the current uh, time for a vision of what the future could look like, right? You could look at something like F sharp, which what it did with type providers, um, gosh, 10 years ago or something like that. The ability to have annotated schema in the data sets, the ability to have um, tab completion on column fields, you know, like in the IDE. These are the kinds of things we can get to because someone already did it 10 years ago. So we surely could do it in Python, um, but it's about getting the massive energy together, getting, getting the mass and the energy and the resources and the innovators and getting all the bits lined up just right. So someone goes and makes the next great thing. Um, I would say the other thing is, you know, again, as humans, we're always good at seeing what we see and not seeing what we can't see. So the, un, the unseen things that are here are how much compilers you don't have to fight anymore because you can con install, right? Or because wheels exist. So it's a whole lot better than trying to install SciPy in 2010, right? So we have made some progress. And I think that's evidence, uh, hopefully, for belief in the idea that we can make even more progress moving forward. Thanks. 
Hello, I have a question. Yeah, please. So Peter, great presentation. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, especially the portion on visualizations and mm -hmm. probably what you shouldn't do that we've all done um, was really, really helpful. My question is, as a novice um, kind of data scientist just getting into my strides with developing proficiency with coding, programming, et cetera, it mm -hmm. seems that while I'm trying to develop that proficiency, there is also this wave of low code to no code platforms that are rolling out that seem to be mm -hmm. the antithesis of proficiency and programming. So I'm just wondering what right. your thoughts are on the resiliency of programmers and what should motivate us to continue to strive for proficiency in context of the push for no code or low code environments. Mm. Yes, excellent question, thank you. Um, really great question. And this is gonna get a little philosophical, but I would ask you this, when you're using a no-code environment, how many, it, did any of you like watch like competitive Warcraft, or, or sorry, competitive Starcraft? And like the RTS, like the like Dota and Starcraft, like the e-games and e-sports, sorry, kind of stuff, do you guys watch that at all? Um, the professional Starcraft, you know, most people probably know of games where you're like, like Starcraft, where you're clicking units around on a battlefield and you're attacking enemy units, you're like mining something over here to make more units and things like that. I promise you this will tie back to the answer, okay? But I play, that, I play games like that a lot in college and whatnot. When you look at the pro leagues, they actually monitor, they have a rate, which is actions per minute. And it's how many actions that human, yeah, the NVIDIA, the NVIDIA guys certainly know what I'm talking about because they're all gaming on NVIDIA GPUs. But, um, but, uh, but, the, um, but the idea here is that they're rating those human actors on the basis of how many actions per minute they're taking, right? Because ultimately, uh, if you are making 100 actions per minute and someone's only making 60, you are essentially running a faster OODA loop than them, observe, orient, decide, action, right? You're actually taking more actions. So by the time they've figured out what they're going to do to counter your move, you've already, you've already put things in place to counter their counter because you are just doing so much more. Okay, what does that have to do with no-code environments? When you're using a no-code environment, how many decisions per minute are you making? How much actual human insight are you putting into the thing? And here's the thing. If all you're doing is dropping some combinatoric set of possible boxes onto a canvas, wiring up some small n number of output ports to some small k number of input ports, and you're doing this kind of thing, at the end of the day, GPT-3 or 4 is going to outperform you on that task. Right? And this is essentially what the data robot, the auto ML kind of things are already doing is that on stuff that we would have wasted a lot of time, like just munging features and things like that, we kind of will just throw a bunch of GPUs at it and see kind of what it does. And like, you know, it's like 80% good enough as a starting point. Um, I think those, I think when you look at the no code environments, um, at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, and this is a very like brutally difficult question, uh, but you have to ask yourself like, what is the value I seek to add to this process? Where is the human in the loop? How can I become a more powerful and more, more, more powerful, more valuable human in the loop? So find a loop that privileges human um, uh, uh, in, you know, input and then be that input providing, be that human providing that valuable input feedback. If you find a situation where you're not adding a whole lot of input, guess what? Your job's gonna be probably gone in five years because I guarantee you there'll be some automated ML way to automate your job away. Right? So when we order from menus, uh, it's at restaurants because there's only a finite number of things the chef can make and that they have in stock in the kitchen. When we go and we try to express ideas to each other, we use language because it is so much more expressive. And actually even GPT-3 is <laughs> questioning how expressive that really is relative to a combinatorial neural net. But at the end of the day, my answer to the low code and no code stuff is that I think those kinds of tools will be most powerful in the kinds of workflow aspects that were maybe never that hard to start with and they will be automated away. And once they're automated away, who's left holding value? Who's left propping up value chain? It's the people who know what to do after that stuff is done. And so I do think that being said, I don't wanna to be too dismissive of the whole area because I think there's a lot of value to giving existing business analysts um, tools to use to orchestrate some kinds of data flows. I think that's val valuable. But what all of these graphical and low code slash no code um, programming environments, what they suffer from is the instant 
that something doesn't fit within the programming paradigm or the instant you get to a certain level of complexity, it actually instantly becomes harder than if you had just coded Python in the first place. So I would say the complexity curve for Python looks like this. For no code, and I would, just, I would say Excel is a low code slash no code environment. The complexity looks like this, right? This is how hard the problem is. This is how much effort, how hard the problem is, how much effort the human puts in. The no code stuff looks like this, and then you hit this massive like steep cliff. Python, you start a little bit up like this, but you have purchase, you have the ability to tackle those harder problems. If something doesn't quite work, you're stuck there waiting for the vendor to roll in that tweak on that algorithm to tweak that coefficient of that parameter, and they don't, they're not gonna release it for six months, sorry, right? Versus if you did it in Python, you just drop in, you monkey patch that particular function in SciPy, and you say, you know, screw it, I'm, I want this particular distribution, and you can do it, right? So that's the kind of thing that, um, and again, going back up to higher business level, the businesses that employ the people who can move with more agility over more complex data sets are going to do better in the long run. That's just the, the kind of market Darwinism that will impose itself on that. That's, sorry, that was a long philosophic screed. Did that kind of answer your question a little bit? Does that make sense? No, it, it did, absolutely. That perspective was awesome. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thank you. Thank you. So Python is worth the effort, I'm just telling you. <laughs> <laughs> You're not biased at all. <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. I would, I would dovetail on that and say, because I've been very, I feel the allure of something like H2O AI, like very strongly. I'm like, oh, look, this is like a data scientist in a box. Um, but I, I really like the way Peter explained it in saying that <clears throat> the learning curve for the, you know, for the, like the automated solutions gets really steep when you want to customize things or like as soon as it gets interesting it's like all of a sudden it's like oh this is hard to handle but i like i love python but also i've i've never regretted the time i invested learning the math right like once i know the math i'm like it almost like whatever the language whatever the platform is like short like even if it's excel like i could i could express this in like an excel formula right but right. if you don't know what the math is doing like those no code automated solutions will get you most of the way, but then it's like that extra like competitive edge that, you know, like other people won't have, or like that glaring mistake that you would have caught if you'd been following it a little bit more deeply than if you just let the robot like lead you there. Yeah. I think something else to just to dovetail onto this, onto your dovetail, keep in mind the world is not constant. And in fact, the pace of innovation in this space is changing is accelerating. And what I mean by that is that, okay, now it's vector hardware in the cloud and it's all, it seems like, okay, we're sort of settling into like a, we know what's going on. Um, next gen inference at the edge, next gen uh, low power embedded systems, next gen, you know, um, uh, holomorphic encryption, as well as privacy preserving kind of prediction things, all that kind of stuff is coming down the pipe. And that's gonna kind of mess you up if all you know how to do is plug some boxes together, right? You need to understand the theory behind it because if you do, check this out. You're not just going to be employable at some big employer. You're mm -hmm. going to know how to solve a really cool problem and you might be able to join some startup or start your own startup doing something deeply entrepreneurial and interesting and make yourself way more money than if you're just a cog in the machine over here plugging away some graphical tool, right? And I guarantee you the graphical tool will not be plumbed with the latest and greatest algorithms. With the, with, you know, it might run on a big old cloud computing because look, if you're a product manager at these companies and, and, I, and I know the founders of these companies, I mean, they're, they're trying to do the right thing, they're good people, but ultimately they have to make a very judicious uh, Pareto trade-off about what do I build? What's the next feature? I've got a finite number of engineers. What do I build? I build a thing that solves the 80% problem. Well, the 80% problem is exactly the thing that's gonna commoditize the fastest all the alpha in your personal life, in your business's uh, you know, thing, all that alpha is captured on the edge. It's all, um, some, a friend of mine made this incredible, incredible observation. He said, capitalism is about, um, capitalism basically reigns at the margin. Let me see if I can find his quote here. Um, dang it, I can't find it now. But he's made this incredible observation. All of the gain is at the margin. Everything else commoditizes. And so, if you are talking about your own personal career investment in a time, we're just at the dawn of the AI and cybernetic era, right? Every single ounce of effort you put into learning how the stuff actually works right now, it's like learning how to program some like Apple one back in 78 is worth it, is worth it, right? So 
the the stuff that's coming down the pike is just incredible to think about. And all of those things are going to be most agile. If you can write Python code and run on some low power MicroPython, you're way more valuable than somebody who only knows how to click through some like collab dashboard, right? So anyway. I don't Peter, is, it like, um, is it like learning Python in 2000? <laughs> 99 version yeah, 152. 99. Yeah, early days, man. That was fun. Remember, remember Visual Python? Oh, yeah. There's oh, Visual yeah. Python and there's VPython. Uh -huh. And there's still Tickle TK. I mean, this, yeah, it's, it really, it's amazing. It's been a 20 some odd year journey, but it, the, how to say this right? It doesn't seem like it's a crude 20 years of detritus, although I'm not a core maintainer, so maybe they would disagree with me on that. But it's like a lot of the stuff I learned back then is still relevant today, you know? A very, a very wise programmer that I used to work with from, uh, he used to work at Bell Labs, but he always said, um, it's better to be lucky than smart. <laughs> In defense of learning programming, I'd also say you're not, you're not just learning this or that language or this or that formula or this or that like syntax. You're learning how to problem solve, and You're, yes, that keeps me so sharp, right? Like, throw me a new language, throw me a new like platform, throw me a new automated no code, like whatever it is. Uh, learning to code and program teaches you how to problem solve and learn. Well, well which yeah, is more well, expressive, mathematics or UI? <laughs> huh? There's that, but but this is a really important thing. This ties to that software development versus data science thing. Software developers learning programming languages are learning how to. Uh, configure a finite state machine. Um, so you're learning a VM, you're learning a, whether that VM is an x86 processor, or whether that VM is like the JVM or the Python, C Python VM, you're learning um, a higher level abstraction representation of a iterated, you know, rapidly iterated um, finite state machine. That's a different kind of coding than when you're writing kind of data science code expressing mathematical concepts, expressing the relationships between data sets, how to transform them, how different kinds of math relates to them. Yeah. You are wiring things up on an ethereal plane. And that stuff doesn't matter how much the underlying um, hows and the innards of the VMs change. That stuff will always be relevant. And this is what I mean about when I say data science is not the same as software development. And also, even though you're using the same languages, and why it is a literacy. You're, th you're actually understanding how to couch your ideas about data transformation and mathematical relationships in a way that is computable, right? Not just a mathematician on the blackboard, but oh, all this stuff. Yeah, I just do this thing, put this on transform and you're done. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> not done yet, right? Because I have to operate within the limits of memory and CPUs and wattage and all this other stuff. So that's really the, I think that's the important thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, this has been awesome. Thank you guys so much for the questions and everything. Um, this has been, it's a lot of, I love talking about this stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you, Peter. We, we super appreciate it. Uh, for the rest of you, like all 22 of you who remain, we will be doing this again <laughs> next month. Um, so we'll send out some, uh, some emails, some announcements. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, PyData DC. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. And thanks for all the good questions, the feedback. Yeah, Peter, this is an awesome talk. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for all the shout outs. I did too. <laughs> of course. No, I love I love the the what's going on in Rapid. So it's good stuff. Take care. Thanks everyone.